This is Stephen Lett. He's a governing body member of Jehovah's Witnesses, as high up as you get in the organization. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. He has some disturbing ideas on society, women, ex-members of the organization, and a lot more. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses have this TV show they do every month called JW Broadcasting. It's an hour long, laced with ridiculous propaganda, and it's required viewing for members of the religion. It gets weird. Real weird. This episode revolved around separating yourself from the rest of society, not having any friends outside the religion, isolating yourself from family members who aren't part of the group, that kind of thing. What makes this religion more destructive than most is the fact that they don't only ban members from being friends with outsiders, but ban them from even acknowledging the existence of people who are critical of the group, like myself. If a Jehovah's Witness saw me on the street, they're expected to, and have, looked at me, and then averted their eyes at any cost. They'll pretend I'm a ghost. Won't even give me the time of day. That includes my mom and best friends while growing up. They call us apostates, even people who are mildly critical of the religion. They give the same treatment to ex-members, critical of the religion or not. That's a hallmark of a cult. Separate members from the rest of society. They've gone at apostates pretty hard in the past, but the new JW Broadcasting episode was all about how evil apostates are. Naturally, I had to talk about it. Let's get into it. As I mentioned earlier, this is governing body member Stephen Lett. He believes himself to be a modern day prophet, one of very few. He speaks for God. If you don't believe that he speaks for God and everything he says belongs in a new version of the Bible, the book of Lett chapter three, then you're an apostate too. Who are you gonna believe, Stephen Lett or your lying eyes? Everything I've ever said that was critical of the religion has been backed up by evidence. Now we'll get to Stephen Lett in a second, but I wanna do some lightning round criticisms first. I'll keep them short and then we'll watch some of the JW Broadcasting video. I don't like the fact that they give specific instructions to parents of kids who don't want to be part of the organization anymore, no matter what age, 10, 11, 12 years old, to stop being a part of the kid's life. Only give them what they're legally required to give them, food and a place to sleep nothing else. Treat them like an outsider in the home. I don't like the fact that they misinterpret the Bible to say that taking blood transfusions is a bad thing. It's gotten countless people killed. I don't like the fact that they force members not to talk to people who left their religion or risk being removed themselves. I don't like the fact that they used old Bible math from the 1800s to arrive at the year 1878 for when Jesus returned to earth. And when nothing happened, they changed it to 1881, and then 1913, and then 1914, and then 1918, then 1919, 1922, 1925, 1975. It keeps going. Failed prophecy after failed prophecy. They believe that the United Nations is a great beast from the book of Revelation and will be involved in the downfall of society generally and Jehovah's Witnesses more specifically. This is a linchpin of their beliefs. It all falls apart if it doesn't turn out to be true. So when the Guardian uncovered the fact that they were registered and getting benefits from their status as an NGO with the UN, it made massive waves through the organization. We as Jehovah's Witnesses were literally being beaten to death in some cases and persecuted terribly all through the 1900s and 2000s for not saying the Pledge of Allegiance, for not celebrating holidays, refusing to serve in the military in countries where military service is mandatory for every citizen, and Jehovah's Witnesses governing body members are breaking their own standards by joining the UN? It was such a big deal that there was a mass exodus at the time. They started disfellowshipping people who asked about it. This is back in the early 2000s. There are a billion issues I could address here. Those are some of the biggest, in my opinion, but they're damning. Any single thing I've mentioned so far would be enough to get me disfellowshipped, shunned, hated by my friends and family. And I am. I haven't had a relationship with my mom in 15 years because I don't want to be in the organization anymore. There's a lot not to like about this religion, but there's only so much time in the day. So with that context in mind, let's see what they have to say about apostates. Satan continues his work as an evil ventriloquist using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice, these acting as his agents, either wittingly or unwittingly. 
I could understand that criticism if there wasn't hard evidence for this stuff. If it was all lies, fine, but it's not. There's endless evidence of what I've said already. Just take the blood issue. They misinterpreted the Bible. You don't even need to rely on news articles for that one. The verse they used to justify refusing blood transfusion is Leviticus 17.10. It says, I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. Ignoring the fact that the Old Testament is nullified since Jesus came back, and all of the old laws are irrelevant for modern day Christians, the interlinear version of the Bible gives a direct, exact translation. The verse translated directly from Hebrew, word for word, actually says, against that person my face, and I will set blood any eats who among you. The word is yokal, meaning to eat, devour, through your mouth and into your stomach. It says nothing about life-saving medical treatments. It's a clear misinterpretation. So call me a puppet of Satan if you want, I just don't like that this organization is getting people killed because they're misinterpreting the Bible. Keep listening. But now, let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing, but Satan's underlings or strangers tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919, and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. So what's the implication? Obviously, even now, Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. For context, the faithful and discreet slave is a term used in the Bible at various points. Jehovah's Witnesses think it's talking about the organization's leadership, basically. Prophets who get divine inspiration from God himself to direct the organization to do this or that. Did you notice what he said at the end there? Even individual members of the governing body have to trust the faithful and discreet slave. They are the faithful and discreet slave! So it seems like he's saying decisions that he's made have to be respected and can't be questioned, even by him, because Jesus Jesus appointed him to make those decisions. Even if he doesn't understand those decisions, they're decisions that he made, so he has to follow them. That's insane! Is he not seeing how this could and has led to disaster? Some governing body member in 1967 said you aren't allowed to get organ transplants. Well, the decision was made. We can't question Jehovah now. We have to stick to our guns. Except they reversed that decision in 1980. They make up some bizarre excuses for it too, like claiming that getting an organ transplant changed is your personality. 1975 Watchtower, September 1st, page 519 of the bound volume, Insight on the News. But when it becomes convenient for them, they do change prophecy. They call it new light. They changed the transplant rule again in 1980, as I said. Now you are allowed to get an organ transplant, and I guess it doesn't change your personality. So which one is it? Up until the 1980s, Jehovah's Witnesses were allowed to leave the organization and continue to talk to their friends and family. But when a governing body member, Ray Franz, left the religion behind, Mind, they specifically changed that policy. You aren't allowed to talk to people who were kicked out or people who left of their own free will. They have a standard set of logic they use for when they want to change a policy. If they do want to change the rules, they say Jehovah revealed more of the picture for them by shedding new light on the situation. So they change their beliefs to reflect what Jehovah showed them. If they don't want to change the rules, they say they have to trust the faithful slave's decisions. Jesus entrusted them with the organization. They might not understand why things are the way they are, but it isn't their place to understand. It's their place to do what Jesus says. How convenient, right? Put all the blame on Jesus. Keep watching, it gets weirder. But what does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. And who often have the loudest voice promoting this false message? Apostates. I'm not saying he'll mislead you, I'm saying the governing body is inconsistent and nonsensical. They flip-flop back and forth constantly, and their decisions are downright immoral. Shunning a 10-year-old child is wrong. It was instructed in the 2007 Watchtower, January 15th, page 20. It says, quote, If your child is unrepentant and is a baptized Christian, he may receive the strongest form of discipline, being disfellowshipped from the congregation, end quote. Disfellowshipping can happen for any number of reasons, including 
including but not limited to attending a funeral or wedding of somebody who isn't a Jehovah's Witness, refusing to use their translation of the Bible, bringing up any criticism to the religion at all, there are a billion possible reasons for it. I was disfellowshipped for smoking a cigarette at a party with some friends when I was 18. Let's keep reading. Quote, the extent of contact that you will then have with him depends on his age and other circumstances. If the child is a minor and is living at home, you will naturally continue to take care of his physical needs. He also requires moral training and discipline, and you have the responsibility to provide these. End quote. It goes on to talk about how little involvement you should have in their lives as they get older. When it's no longer a legal requirement, you won't care for their physical needs anymore either. The point is that you shouldn't give them anything more than what's required by law. You should withdraw your love from them until they get reinstated as a Jehovah's Witness. That is simply immoral. I don't care who said it. If God himself wrote that in the Bible, which he didn't, but if he did, I'd have the same criticism. In a second, he's going to address one of the biggest criticisms any apostate has for the organization. Before we continue, I want to mention something. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and mugs and stuff on there. Or you can check out my other YouTube channels. I have my Fireside Chat channel, where I talk about the intersection between religion and politics. I have my Telltale Unfiltered channel, where I watch sermons and long-form breakdowns of these types of people. Or you can check out my Telltale Reads channel, where I read books by extremists. Right now, we're reading Greg Locke's book, This Means War, We Will Not Surrender Through Silence. It gets absolutely nutty, so give it a watch if it sounds interesting. All links are in the description. Okay, let's continue with Jehovah's Witnesses. He's about to address my biggest criticism. Check it out. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Those are both bald-faced lies. Actually, I said they covered up child mistreatment in CSA. That's backed up by endless lawsuits against the organization. Not only were these lawsuits filed, but they won. Jehovah's Witnesses have been paying out the nose for how they mishandled these cases. The biggest problem is that they treated CSA as a sin, not a crime. They have something called the Two Witness Rule, which is from the Bible. It was intended for civil problems originally. If a contract isn't signed in front of two witnesses, then it didn't happen. You purchased a donkey from that guy? Better have two witnesses there to vouch for the transaction. Jehovah's Witnesses applied the Two Witness Rule to criminal matters, like CSA, instead of what it was intended for, civil matters. If there aren't two witnesses to the attack, or two victims, then it didn't happen. After two witnesses come forward, they reported to the police, instead of calling the police immediately as they should have. Naturally, the system was taken advantage of, and there were people all through the 80s and 90s who would attack a single kid in the congregation, and when they were found out, they'd move to another congregation and do it again. Since no single congregation ever had two witnesses, nobody connected the dots, and they went on to do this for years and years. If you think I'm making this up, I'm not. Here's the the evidence. It can be found in the description too. And what did Jehovah's Witnesses do when faced with what they did? They lawyered up, naturally. They didn't try to solve the problem, they didn't work with law enforcement to guarantee it didn't happen again, they shut everything down, excommunicated the people involved if they weren't already, and ceased cooperation and communication. Definitely something God's organization would do. That's just one shining example of corruption, and something that's earned me the label of apostate. The reason why Stephen Lett is out here talking about how evil apostate states are, and why you should never communicate with or believe anything they say. Anybody looking into this organization can see it for what it is. Deeply immoral. Regarding the criticism that they live lives of luxury, it's hard to avoid criticism like that when they go out there wearing Rolex watches when they do these little videos. I'm not a watch person, maybe these aren't Rolexes, I can't really tell, but next time you go in front of a camera, maybe take these fancy looking watches off. One of the other governing body members, Tony Morris, famously got filmed in a liquor store buying like 600 dollars worth of top shelf alcohol and it was such a hot topic of discussion for a while that a governing body helper responded with a statement about it they were ambiguous but basically said we had no way to know if he was independently wealthy before he became a governing body member so it's possible that none of your mom's money was being used on his top shelf liquor let's keep listening to this epic takedown of apostates acts 2030 says that apostates speak twisted things they do this in order to draw God's sheep away and make them followers of themselves. Something that's twisted is bent out of shape or distorted. 
They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context, or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie or into a misleading half-truth. Well, in the strictest sense, I guess I'm trying to build followers on YouTube, but it's not so they'll worship me the way Jehovah's Witnesses seem to worship the governing body. My entire goal is to get people out of destructive cults, which this very definitely is, and I always come with evidence. In fact, I have a list of links to sources for everything I've talked about so far in this video if you're curious. And like I said, I don't even need a source to point out that it's wrong to abandon your children if they stop believing the same things you do, or that eating blood is not the same as getting a life-saving blood transfusion. That should be self-evident, but apparently it's not because Jehovah's Witnesses to this day refuse to back up off that doctrine. Let's keep listening. 2 Peter 2.3 says, They will greedily exploit you with counterfeit words. A counterfeit is something that's carefully designed to look like the real thing. Take, for example, counterfeit money. It might look genuine, but it's fake and thus worthless. If we're deceived into accepting it, we'll lose money. But if we're deceived into accepting the counterfeit words of apostate, we'll lose our life. And apostates will give us absolutely nothing of value in exchange. And here come the fear tactics. This is right out of the cult playbook. Lock people into a group by holding their friends and family hostage. If you leave, then you'll lose everything and everybody you ever loved. If you listen to this other person, you'll lose your life. What do they have to offer? Well, that's a good question. What do I have to offer you? Your freedom. I'm offering you freedom from this restrictive, destructive cult. You don't even have to follow me. You just have to recognize this group for what it is. You've wasted enough of your life on this already. You still believe in God? Great, move to another religion, preferably one that doesn't exhibit qualities of extremism and control. Lots of good Methodist churches out there that don't hate anybody for anything. Or just walk away from it entirely like I have. The world is your oyster once you realize these people are not prophets of God like they claim to be. They have tons of failed prophecies under their belts, tons of misinterpreted Bible verses, tons of deaths on their hands from the orders they passed down to their members, like the blood transfusion ban, and demanded they follow unless they want to lose everything. I I offer you nothing but your mind. In the next one, he gives us the old carrot and stick routine. Check this out. But if we're deceived into accepting the counterfeit words of apostate, we'll lose our life. Can you imagine really needing a loving shepherding visit and asking apostates to give you one? Here's the carrot. We have your friends and family on this side of the fence. If you stay, you can remain friends with them. You can receive shepherding visits from other Jehovah's Witnesses. Here's the stick. If you leave, you lose your life. This is an example of him building in fears and phobias. Again, this is a hallmark of a cult. If I approach this group in a vacuum, these are the exact traits I'd look for to see if it was a destructive cult or not. It's almost like they read the psychology literature on destructive cults and said to themselves, yeah, I'll take that. Keep watching. Similarly, we must be careful about believing everything presented in the media about Jehovah's organization. Remember, the media is commonly motivated by prejudice, hatred, and a desire for profit. False and exaggerated news reports are very common. Like I said, you don't need media reports to see how deeply immoral this group is. You don't need to read the sources I left in the description to know how depraved their decisions are. They're proud of the fact that they don't take blood transfusions. They'll even give you the verse they misinterpreted. They're proud of the fact that they have a problem with the LGBT community, or outsiders in general. They're proud of the fact that they control people's behaviors, creating a de facto Pavlovian response in people to form out new personalities. They even call it that, the new personality. You're supposed to drop your old personality and put on the Jehovah's Witness one when you join. If you can believe it, there's more. They did a whole drama video about how terrible apostates are. There's a Jehovah's Witness girl who has two Jehovah's Witness roommates and her mom is a dreaded apostate. Let's watch. Your roommates, you say they're explorers, pioneers. They preach full time, but they work part time. Hmm, I see. But you, you're no. not. No. Not yet, anyway. 
It's obvious to any Jehovah's Witness that this woman was never a Jehovah's Witness herself. Pioneer is a pretty common term for somebody who devotes a bunch of time every month to knocking on people's doors to spread the good news. The times changed since I was in the religion. I think when I was in it, an auxiliary pioneer signed up for 50 hours of door knocking in a month. A pioneer signed up for 50 hours per month for 12 months straight, and a special pioneer did 70 hours per month for 12 months straight. It's been a while, so I might have those figures wrong now. Somebody can correct me in the comments. Anyways, the point here is that the mom was never involved in the religion. If she was involved previously, then she wouldn't be allowed to talk to her mom in the first place. Let's keep watching. Jade, love. All this. I see it's made you a better person. Heaven knows I tried. But I miss bits of the old Jade. Bits? <laughs> what, what bits? Where's the Jade that questioned everything? She should know very well exactly which bits she's talking about. Like I said, Jehovah's Witnesses program people through Pavlovian conditioning to put on what they call the new personality. That's the term they use. You aren't supposed to be the same person anymore. All cults do this to some degree. That's part of what makes them a cult in the first place. Jehovah's Witnesses would argue that it's a good thing because your personality is more in line with the Bible. But it isn't. At all. If there's one takeaway from this video, it's that Jehovah's Witnesses misinterpret what the Bible says regularly. That's not necessarily their fault. The New World Translation has some words changed to back up their already held beliefs. Not much. Nothing dramatic. But it happens. I'll give you one example. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the beast in Revelation is the United Nations. As I mentioned earlier, the verse they use to justify that is in Revelation 17:11, where it talks about the scarlet-colored beast. They believe it's going to be a political entity, like a king or a nation or something. The verse says, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Well, that's the NIV translation. The Jehovah's Witness translation says he springs from the others. That could reasonably be interpreted as the United Nations, right? But the word they translated as springs from in context actually translates to belongs to or of, not springs from. Belongs to could mean that the nation is a territory of another country. Springs from could mean it's a political body like the United Nations. This is a simple example of them changing a word to reflect what they already believe. There's no context in which springs from is correct. No interpretation or translation that could possibly make them arrive at that word. Not to mention the fact that they changed almost every instance of the word Lord in the Bible to Jehovah, even when it doesn't belong there. Even ignoring the fact that God's name is Yahweh, not Jehovah. It's little things like that. It seems small, but when they do that all through the entire Bible, over the course of 31,000 verses, it adds up. Anyways, let's keep watching their anti-apostate video. So then, she pulls out her phone and starts showing me stuff about witnesses. What kind of stuff? News stories, all negative and slanted. I tried to change the subject, but she just kept at it. Negative and slanted are not the same thing. This relates to something called neutrality bias. There's an objective answer to some things. That objective answer might not be somewhere in the middle. The Earth is not flat. That's not a neutral position, it's a positive claim, but it's also a correct claim. That's an example of being objective, but not neutral. Everything I've shown you so far shows Jehovah's Witnesses in a bad light because of decisions they've made, because of positions they hold. If they don't like how they look to the outside world, then they're perfectly free to change their policy to make themselves less destructive. But that's the thing. Jehovah's Witnesses aren't even allowed to hear those criticisms. If they're caught on certain websites that are critical of the group, then they'll be disfellowshipped and lose everybody they ever loved, even at 10 years old. So they tend to just not risk it. If your belief isn't weak, then it should stand up to a little scrutiny. Let's keep watching. Mum, I want us to get together, but I won't hear anything negative about my beliefs. Well, perhaps we just won't talk religion. It's a deal then? All right then. I can see I'm not gonna get anywhere. So what subject do you want to talk about? The deal fell apart fast. Jade, I know we weren't going to talk religion, but I must tell you this one thing that Mom, I read. I thought we weren't going to talk about this. It's getting late. 
I'm gonna go. It's interesting they depicted it this way because I've actually been in this exact situation. My mom is a Jehovah's Witness and I'm not. We agreed to not talk about religion at one point, years ago, but I came to realize that as a result of her putting on the Jehovah's Witness personality, it is literally impossible to avoid these conversations. Her entire life revolves around the religion in every way. Everything that happens to her, every thought she has, somehow routes back to Jehovah's Witnesses. They probably don't even realize they're doing it. Every sentence out of her mouth mouth related to Jehovah in some way. In my case, my mom breaks the agreement every single time and gets upset that I tell her I don't want to hear it. The spoken agreement is don't bring up religion. The actual agreement is this is my personality now. It's been formed by Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm going to talk about religion. You aren't allowed to respond. If you break down and respond anyways, I'm going to throw a fit and act like you're the one who broke the agreement. It's honestly deeply sad. Their lives revolve around this in every way, and that's what makes it destructive. They don't have any other interests, by design. Keep watching. Jade, I got an alert this morning, and I'm really Mom, about this. No, I don't. I, I was sure this wouldn't work. And then it happened. Jade, I'd like to change our agreement. If I ask you what you believe, you get to answer. Short answers, I won't be converting. <laughs> it's a deal then? Yeah, it's a deal. It's all about catering to them. It's a deeply selfish position. They refuse to listen to you, but you have to listen to them. This video draws it out pretty clearly. Their relationship will only work if I'm allowed to talk to you about my beliefs, but you aren't allowed to talk to me about yours. This is a propaganda video. It was scripted and created to manipulate people. Every scene, every word was written with the intent to form out the new personality, to show Jehovah's Witnesses what's expected of them. When the new personality takes over like they're depicting in the video here, people will either convert or not be friends with you anymore. This is a destructive cult. I really don't know how to communicate that any more clearly. I get that Stephen Lett and the other governing body members might not see it that way, but it doesn't make it any less true. I don't think most of them have bad intentions. I don't think they even realize it's a cult. Even the governing body members. I think most are true believers, but it doesn't change the fact that it is a cult. If you're in the group, please get out. You do not deserve to be manipulated anymore. You deserve freedom of mind. That's a basic human right as far as I'm concerned. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and mugs and stuff on there. Or you can check out my other YouTube channels. I have my Fireside Chat channel, where I talk about the intersection between religion and politics. I have my Telltale Unfiltered channel, where I watch sermons and long-form breakdowns of these types of people. Or you can check out my Telltale Reads channel, where I read books by extremists. Right now, we're reading Greg Locke's book, This Means War, We Will Not Surrender through silence. It gets absolutely nutty, so give it a watch if it sounds interesting. All links are in the description. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.